this is going to call the herd of the 4 billion real estate agents that are in America today. And uh, yeah. the, the cream of the crop will rise and they'll be fine and everyone else will go find another job. So the big question is this, how do most agents who don't have access to the secrets that the top agents in our industry hoard to themselves grow and prosper in today's real estate environment? That's the question. And this video podcast is the answer. I'm Pat Hyben and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Amuchastegui. We are recording live the Real Estate Rockstars State of the Market 43. And we have some really, really special guests today to help me talk about the news. First, I've got Curtis Roddy. He's the COO of Roddy's Foreclosure Listing Service out of Dallas, Texas. Curtis, thanks for being on here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And we've got Brandon Turner. He is host of the largest real estate investment podcast uh, around the Bigger Pockets podcast. I'm sure you guys have heard of him. Got these guys on here today to help talk about the news. Brandon, thanks for being here too. Yeah, this should be fun. Uh, definitely the largest, not not the best, second best <laughs> to yours. But you know, we're, we got some work to do, but we'll get there. Yeah the uh, the 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 real estate podcasting competition out there. That's so, it. Yeah, it's you you and I were neck to neck. But, neck uh, and- I'm, I'm a slow start. I'm like the I'm like the tortoise. You're the yeah, hair. We're, you know? we're only like eight hundred thousand downloads behind you this month, but the, we're but, on our way. So catching up. There. You know. It's okay. (laughs) This will be a fun, fun day. You know, so Rockstar Nation, you know, we come on here to talk about the real estate news. Maybe some of you guys remember five, six weeks ago, we came on here and we said, hey, the coronavirus might crash the real estate market. That was our headline. And at the time, that seemed really far-fetched. It seemed really crazy. And like you've heard us the last few weeks, all we've been doing is trying to prepare content and news to talk to you about what's happening with the coronavirus, what's happening nationwide, and how that is changing on a week-to-week basis. You know, so, the, so right now, out in Austin, Texas, we're all on shelter in place. The you know, people are, and, and around most of the US, people are on shelter in place. But it seems like good people are starting to feel okay. You know, it's, been, it's been a couple weeks, but a lot of businesses are closed. But you know, sometimes you know, people are on social and they're, they're getting used to it. Sometimes they're freaking out, but a lot of businesses have closed. We're seeing a lot of innovation out there. The Brandon out in Maui, have you seen have you seen a change yet? What's going on out there? Yeah, uh, we're in shelter in place as well. I think they have a another name for it here, but uh, that's that's what it is. Uh, we cannot go to the beach. You can go in the water. So I have been actually surfing more than I have regularly. You just can't go with, with other people in the water uh, unless it's your family. You can go on walks as long as it's with your immediate family only. And other than that, pretty much every business is shut down. So it's a it's a lockdown here as well. So you can be in the water, you can't be on the beach. So you just sprint right through the sand and hope you don't get caught. I hope you don't get caught. Yeah, just hop on and over it. <laughs> no, I actually heard the story the other day of this guy who was riding his bike, and you can you can exercise, like right. So you can jog, ride bike, whatever. So he's the sun is going down, and you guys know Maui sunsets are like you know you can't not watch them. So the sun's going down, and this guy stops his bike. He just stops it and turns to watch the sunset. Cop comes over and gives him a ticket, like five hundred bucks for for watching the sunset, even though he's on his bike. So, wow, yeah, that's they, crazy. Uh, they do not want people hanging out. You either are exercising or, which is a good way to, you know, if you're like me and you're not good at exercising, you know, a good way to keep motivated. You got to keep running. I guess that's like a $500 <laughs> ticket if you stop running. Yeah. Don't stop running. If you're somewhere <laughs> outside and you're not in motion, you can yep. get ticketed. You know, Maui is pretty extreme. I think it was maybe a couple weeks ago they made the announcement and said, if you go visit Maui, you're going to have to do a two week shelter in yep. place inside your hotel. Like we were supposed to be out there for my birthday next month, get to come see and hang out again. And the hotel ended up canceling it and said, Hey, if people have to shelter in place for two weeks at our hotel, that's no fun. We're not going to be the ones monitoring them to make sure they stay out of the pool. So we're just going to close down. Yep. My uh, brother-in-law came out here. Well, he went home for like the weekend, like a week ago and then came back and has to stick for two weeks in a, in the, he's working on a project for me. So he's basically at the rental house that I bought here. And he's just like, has to stay there and work all day, which is great for me. Cause now he gets to work like <laughs> yeah, 120 hours a week. Tons of productivity. I think, I think yeah, maybe I'm everyone's easy. getting more productivity right now with shelter in place. Cause you can either, you know, cause like people are just bored. 
Yeah, either that or they're getting the Corona 15. It's like the freshman 15, but it's the yeah. Corona 15. Yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of that going on. Who's going to yeah. eat? You know, yesterday I interviewed a guy and the I, I interviewed Dave Hollis, and that one's going to publish next week. But one of the things he kind of brought up is that every, you know, it takes 30 days to get a habit, right? So 30 days you form a habit. Well, we're into these like 60 to 90 day kind of forced habits right now. So what are you yeah. going to come out of coronavirus with? What are you going to come out of the shelter in place? Are you going to work hard? form a new habit or not. So the, Dude, I just, I just told my performance coach that I had a call this morning and he said, uh, he was weird to think about like what meaning you apply to this. And I was like, you know what, when it comes to like food and health and nutrition, a lot of people are going to look at this situation and go, well, you know, it's a unique situation. I'm at home anyway. Who cares if I gain some weight and, you know, lose my diet and exercise goals. But I, I want to look at this the opposite way. Look, normally, I mean, I go out to eat way too much. Right now, I can't go out. So this is an opportunity for me to like, dr- you know, like, like really like drill down on what I want to like, what I want to do with my body. And so I've actually upticked my eating, like he- healthy eating and my workouts. Because this is all how you look at this. You can either look as an excuse to, to let yourself go or as a good forced reason to get in better shape. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can go both ways. I mean, you're definitely going to save money right now. Like definitely the, for people money. that, for people that eat out, the, I mean, it's totally going to change everything. So, well, let's, let's jump right into the news. The, you know, Curtis, one of the reasons you're on here today is so much of the news that's all over Inman, all over, you know, the LA times everywhere is talking about foreclosure postings and what we're going to see in foreclosure postings last week. And, and in the last two weeks, some of the news was if somebody's behind on their mortgage, there's all these new forbearance opportunities out there. And what we've seen so far is some lenders are letting people not make payments. And really in three months, they're just going to start making payments again. It's going to tack on to the end. Other lenders have forbearance that three months from now, they're just going to owe three months worth of payments, right? And so there's a lot of belief that when that happens, you know, foreclosures will rise. But the if somebody's going to buy a foreclosure in Texas, they have to buy the list from Roddy's Foreclosure Listing Service. Today was auction. So you know, 200 and something counties, auction in Texas, what was the news today, though? What what happened out there at auction? People all day long were saying, will there be an auction? Won't there be an auction? What happened overall? Yeah, it was crazy. We had chats coming in, text messages all day asking whether or not we were going to have auctions. Uh, counties across the state all said there were going to be no auctions. Um, and so that was a little concerning initially to us. We saw uh, most of the courthouses were closed. So in Texas, the, the uh, foreclosure sale usually has to occur on the courthouse steps. Most of them were closed. So uh, We've had trustees and we had uh, investors lining up outside to uh, purchase foreclosures. So, um, you know, typically we'll have, you know, 50 or 60 in some of our major counties, uh, 50 or 60 major uh, sales. Uh, in those same counties, we saw three or four. And so it was, it was definitely a different vibe at the courthouse today, um, uh, really through it at all of them. But the exciting part was we still had sales happen, um, contrary to what the uh, counties were saying. Right. So that was kind of the belief that there is forbearance available, you know, foreclosure moratoriums available, but it's supposed to be specific. People are supposed to ask for it. I think the first month of moratoriums too, people are always a little bit more nervous. Like, yeah. I mean, great. yeah, we saw, I mean, there's, there's articles out there that say there's like a 2000% uh, spike in people requesting these forbearances right now. And the, the lenders just can't keep up with that. So, I mean, we're in, we're in month one of the four of this um, people that are requesting a forbearance right now or, or that were posted uh, for the April auction, probably weren't caught up in the COVID kind of crisis yet. Tell me the, I saw reports today that, so it's kind of like Brandon's idea deal The you know, the guy's out there riding a bike, he stops, he gets a ticket. What happened to people when no sales were happening out there? So usually your teams are out there, they're standing in front of the courthouse. They're just trying to provide information to people. And, and I heard some stories, what happened? Yeah, it was crazy. So we have uh, teams covering the 22 major counties in Texas and in uh, most of them, we actually had sheriff's deputies come and uh, escort our teams off the uh, premises. Usually, you know, they let them uh, stay there for about an hour. But, um, you know, around 11, 12 o'clock, uh, they were getting calls, supposedly. And, and uh, they were, most of our teams were escorted off or asked to uh, go sit in their car. Yeah. So run through the beach, run through the courthouse. Don't be ready. The, uh, well, that is, you know, some of the foreclosure news we're going to talk about today. But the, so the big news in Texas is some foreclosures happened significantly less happened as the first month out in California every day. They're used to you know, 300 sales a day and they're getting 20 or 30 sales a day right now. And they traditionally are the, the strange loans. You know, the first ones out are always the investor loans, not the FHA, not the ones that are you know, kind of that backed stuff by a big servicer. They're ones that have smaller servicers and they're a little bit, you no, know, those investors are a little more gutsy. 
the, you know, Brandon, I sent you some of the articles coming out. One that I thought that maybe I wanted to see your opinion on, cause you're out in, you're out in, in Maui. It, you know, there's the hotels are closed now. There's so much of the world out there is travel. There's a Dallas developer. This was an in Inman industry industry news today. It says Dallas developer pays up for hotel rooms for medical professionals. So Dallas based development company Centurion American spent nearly $800,000 to provide free rooms to medical professionals at luxury hotel, the Statler during the pandemic. So the, you know, we actually had a, a nurse reach out to us on one of our Airbnbs up in Oregon. And she's like, Hey, I'm afraid to go home to my family right now. You know, could I get a discounted rate to go stay at the Airbnb? So there's a lot of nurses mm-hmm. about there wanting to go stay at hotels. What do you think? What do you think about that? You know, did, that developer doing that says average hotel room costs 130 to 30 bucks a night. And the, it's like the whole, whole hotel. Communist. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty hefty, what, $800,000 that we said? $800,000. Yeah, that's a chunk of money, I mean, to give away. I mean, I, I'm like super like, what's the word? Not like, I'm cynical. And so my, yeah. my mind is always like, okay, well, what's, what kind of PR is he trying to drum up for this? Which who cares if that's what he's doing? I mean, he's doing good. And why, not, why not get a benefit out of it? But that was always my like, you know, you know, did he hire the PR team that put together this article and that's why Inman published it? I don't know. That's always my simple yeah. way of looking at it. Uh, you know, that said, maybe he's just being a nice person and they're a nice company and they're helping the nurses. I think that's great. I think there's kind of, there's probably some, you know, kind of interesting business play in there too. Cause it's like a dead asset, mm-hmm. right? When you talk about like what every, all my, all of our Airbnb bookings were completely canceled. I'm sure yep. hotels have mostly canceled. So they've got this dead asset and the, you know, and maybe if you're getting government money to keep people employed, right? So you get a, you get a stimulus to say, hey, our hotel workers, we could pay them to be there, but no one's going to stay there. Well, maybe, you know, putting the nurses in there helps offset it. But the, you know, I would challenge, there's probably a lot of opportunities for us in real estate out there to look around and say, hey, what is, do we have any dead assets out there that might be able to, yeah. you know, help in this? I don't know what they are. Like I could, I picture them turning schools into hospitals and things like that. But right now the medical industry seems to have a pretty good handle on what's happening. Nobody just, just nobody knows when we get to start going outside again. Yeah. Yeah. I read an article this morning. I can't remember where it was at, but it basically just said that they're re forecasting the, the virus now based on our current, like what's going on with them, with everyone social distancing. And basically, yeah, they said the hospitals should have enough room. Like they're not really freaked out anymore about like hospitals, like people having to shelter outside, you know, and, and die out on the parking lot. Like that sounds like that's not because of the actions we've taken. That's probably not going to be a likely thing. Right. Do you think that means it worked? Like so far, uh, shelter in place so. has worked. It, I mean, it must, right? I mean, like if yeah. we're if we're not spreading it as fast, I think the whole idea was to slow it down, right? So yeah, it it's de- it, like it could not work. It is definitely slowing down. I mean, we're still going to see what the what the final outcome. There was some a lot of stuff has been written the last few days of people saying, "Hey, you know, would it would it be better to have two million people die than have this crash on our economy?" I think I think for years to come, five, ten, twenty years from now you know, in universities, in ethics classes, yeah. they're going to be talking about this. Like the moral yeah. decision that was made that really, yeah. I mean, maybe the stimulus is going to help, but the, I don't know. I think we're, I think we're bracing for some stuff. You know, and you get crazy people on both sides. Like you, I mean, I'm sure you've seen on your Facebook, right? Like the, like conspiracy theories, <laughs> like, like, you know, this is the government and this is the 5G thing coming down. And this is, I don't know, there, there's so much craziness out there right now of like, you know, I don't know. On both sides, actually. Yeah, but. there is anytime you have, you know, big news happening, the conspiracy theory is, is just, yeah, tripled. You know, there's so much stuff out there on both sides of it and what's going to happen. I think the sad thing is we aren't going to know, you know, what that is until a year or two from now or what the real stats were. So now it's about staying up on it the best we can, trying to forecast, look at our local markets. You know, there was a, uh, so you're know, looking at some of that, like maybe the bad news it says, this article posted by the LA Times today says, Homelenders brace for up to 15 million mortgage defaults. It says mortgage lenders, and this is from uh, Prashant Gopal, actually was the first to publish that on Bloomberg. We've talked to him several times as he's come out and looked at our, at our stuff out in San Antonio. Um, mortgage lenders are preparing for the biggest wave of delinquencies in history. If the plan to buy time works, they may have avert an even worse crisis, mass foreclosures, and mortgage market mayhem. I mean, man, if that's not a headline just to try to scare the crap out of people, I, know, I don't know what it is, yeah. but mortgage market mayhem. But there's some truth to that, right? So the so Curtis, so so far with postings, have you seen any change in postings for things like that? Yeah, I mean, most of the postings we're seeing from May were posted again prior to this, you know, most courthouses shutting down 
Um, I think for, as far as foreclosure are concerned, the biggest uh, hurdle for postings to uh, you know, show up to the courthouse is just going to be the fact that courthouses are not open. And most courthouses still in Texas don't allow for the e-filing of foreclosures. So right now, trustees typically manually get, they bring down a big stack of foreclosure postings and they deliver it to the county clerk. Uh, what we're hearing right now is that county clerks don't want to accept it. Uh, some some uh, clerks are allowing the trustees to set up an appointment uh, to bring their postings in, but um, we're still kind of waiting to see. The deadline in Texas is um, for the May auctions actually next Tuesday. So right now we're seeing, you know, we've got a decent amount of postings. Um, the the big you know thing will be whether or not the June po- you know the June auction maintains this high in postings. Yeah, it's the as you get to see. I think every, as they're waiting for the news to come out and really what the law is supposed to be because they'll see a governor say foreclosures are postponed or you know the president say a foreclosure postponed, but then the local lender saying they they just said that on stage they didn't do anything. Yeah. Right. And then there was a there was a judge in Bear County that actually you know made a ruling and said, hey, there won't be any foreclosures this month. We're not going to let any happen. But then some sales still did happen. So then figuring out real estate rock stars. This is Aaron Amuchastegui. And as you know, when you've been hearing these episodes, so many of our guests give us lots of free gifts and share the tools they've been using to become successful. We've got free real estate tools, scripts, ebooks, marketing materials and more. We keep track of everything in our vault and it's updated with new items each and every week. If you want access to that stuff, it's totally free for being a listener. All you have to do is go to agentsuccesstoolbox.com agentsuccesstoolbox.com and get your free gifts now. The Brandon, were you investing back in 2009, 2010 when foreclosure crisis was kind of at, at its peak? Yeah, I started in 07. So, I mean, I wasn't going crazy then, but yeah, I, I mean, everything I bought was a foreclosure back then. Those were, uh, those were good times for buying deals. Yeah. It's like that investment time right now. The, you know, I think part of what we've seen, it, it seems like from those postings, if, if if it's hard for people to post right now, they're afraid to post right now, courthouses are closed, we've got those forbearances, you know, there's a, you know, it's a couple months, three months, depending, you know, depending on this, the state and their regulations, that there will be this crazy influx of postings. So, I mean, Curtis, back in 2008, 2009, when there was this, stuff, like how many postings, you know, how many postings you guys were having, like in Dallas County a month back then, and how many you ha- you're having right now? Yeah, so I mean, really, prior to this, you know, the two thousand eight, two thousand nine mortgage kind of crisis, there was maybe three or four hundred postings every month in Dallas County, and and that's kind of the same for Bear County, some of the other major counties. Um, the crisis hit, and we were up to twenty five hundred postings every month, a consistent twenty five hundred postings every month per county, uh, per county, and De- yeah, so that's just a, in Dallas County. So, um, and we saw the same kind of ratio increase across all of the. It wasn't just the major counties, it was major and the uh, more rural counties as well. And so we're really going to be able to follow over the next few weeks to see if the foreclosures are stacking up and all of a sudden they, they start hitting those numbers. If you, if it was a 2,500 and now the last few months it's been between three and 500, you know, we'll see if in, in a few months, I won't be surprised. I absolutely will not be surprised if it goes up and it starts hitting, you know, a thousand a month, 1500 a month uh, in counties where we were at three to 500 just months ago. Well, if there's, I mean, this, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so if there's, I mean, if there's a moratorium and, and, you know, people aren't able to, it's not like people are going to be able to pay you know, everything that, you know, that last day. And so um, I can't imagine the banks are going to continue to delay these foreclosures when they're out, allowed to legally um, foreclose on people. I was going to say, I just can't imagine a world where like, I mean, 15 million mortgage. I mean, like, I can't imagine a world where the U S government lets that happen where like, everybody just can't pay their mortgage. So everyone just loses. I mean, like, it's not just those people, it's landlords who can't pay their mortgages. Like I read the other day, it's like, I don't know, it was like eight or 10 million like landlords, like own less than 10 properties. And so like all those people can't pay. And so like, at some point, I feel like the government's got to step in and just be like, all right, we're just going to halt everything here for a little while. Like if this continues bad, now I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I don't think this is going to last forever. But if it did, if this was like six months of lockdown or a year of lockdown, like, no, no bank, no government, no person wants 15 million like mortgages defaulting all in the same month or in a couple months, you know, foreclosed on. So they're, I figure they're going to do something, but yeah. What do you think is going to happen? You think they'll just reset it and say, Hey, okay, the next, you know, we'll just add six months to your loan or how does that I, work? I, the problem right now, of course, like if you read like the, you know, the cares act and all that with the, with the forbearance stuff, like they just like, they don't define what that even means. Right. So everyone yeah. gets to make up their own definition. And so like, I've talked to a number of my banks now and everyone kind of says the same thing. Well, yeah, you can take three months off, but we're going to make you pay all of it on the fourth month. 
Yeah. So it's completely ridiculous. Like, I don't care. I'm not, that's going to help me. And if they stick with that policy, that's going to help anybody. Nobody's going to be able to afford it. That's like you letting a tenant get behind on rent. You guys know rentals, right? You let a tenant get three months behind on rent. Are they, are they ever going to be able to catch up? No, they never do. It's not like they suddenly just inherit money. And so uh, I feel like at some point what will happen, the government will probably step in and just say, no, this is what forbearance means. It means add it to the end of your loan, or you can spread it over a year or something like that. But at some point, they're gonna. They don't want 15 million uh, foreclosures to come down all at once because that just that'll kill everything. Right. Well, they get to remember what happened like last time. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And they, and that, like this would be worse than last time. And they don't like everyone remembers the pain of last time. Yeah. Like people died from that. Right. So yeah. that's that's this other thing that happens like in poverty and for foreclosure and things like that. every time yeah. one of those happens like there's you know there's people that, that struggle through that. So that that's where we're gonna have that ethical conversation five ten years from now is like yeah. what was the right thing to do based on the outcomes. And I love the, the Facebook posts. Of people are like, like, you know, even a single human life isn't worth millions of dollars. I'm like, are, are you sure? Because you drive a car every day and cars kill people. You know, so like everything is a trade off of death. Like everything that we do trades off like mass death in life. Like your cell phone killed a bunch of people who had to mine the stuff for it. You're still wearing, you know, using your iPhone every day. So like it, we as a society have to make those calls at some point on what is a human life worth and what are we willing to, to trade for it? And that's a, that's a hard ethical dilemma. Yeah. And right now, no, nobody wants to make the call that says, so I think the biggest fear that happened with all of this was they didn't, nobody wanted to look like Italy where yep. people were like in the hallway dying because they, they didn't have room for them. Like, yeah. and I think everybody just pictured that, like that could never happen in America. You could never have so many sick people that you're having to turn people away at the door. So it was like preventing that kind of bad press thing. And now, now we'll see. We'll see. see. So we got a, We got another one on Inman says, Post virus home price growth forecasts show a spike in the West. So it says in the wake of the COVID 19 pandemic, home prices are expected to increase at half the rate prior to the outbreak. So that's really interesting. So that's probably the best sounding real estate news I've heard in a long time that they believe that still prices are going to continue to go up, just not quite as fast as before. And they talk about in the West. So it says in the first quarter of 2021, so that's next year. Markets in the western half of the country are anticipated to see the greatest home price growth, according to you know forecasting company Veros Real Estate Solutions. So, talks about Boise, Idaho, Spokane, Washington, Idaho Falls, Idaho, Sierra Vista, Arizona. You know some some markets where I don't think they've had a whole lot of price appreciation. So it says you know it says you know Boise will see a seven point six percent year over year price increase. Spokane will see six point four. And his big thing says home price trends and forecasts certainly take a backseat to the more pressing health and safety issues. We're expecting a softening of housing prices, but we anticipate a rebound as soon as the pandemic subsides. And, you know, a guy that I interviewed last week, he said, you know, every year on the East Coast, we get three months of winter where it's so cold, nothing happens. No one buys a house. No one goes outside, you know, and they come out in the spring and they start buying houses again. So he said, so, you know, why don't we look at this as maybe just an extended spring? And as soon as we can go out, people are going to be like, hey, I want a house. I've been stuck in this little house for a while and I want a bigger house. Now that I mean, they're really going to know the stuff they don't like uh, in their house right now. <laughs> but what do you guys think about that? Do you think that's you think it's too bold to be able to, to guess already and say, hey, we, we think the market's going to go up? I mean, I think it's uh, I think it's fine to predict and make a guess. But the fact that I mean, all of this depends upon stuff that we don't know yet, right? Is this going to last three months? Is it going to last one more month? Is it going to last nine months? Those are all very different outcomes on the real estate market, depending on that. So putting on an article like this is, you know, again, I would like, I'm, I'm cynical, but it's more about PR than, get, you know, get your name in the headlines than anything, because we just don't know. Um, I would agree with that at him, actually. I think you ever like, hold back like a bunch of water. Like I have my hot tub out here in my pool and my hot tub drains into the pool. But if you sit there and like plug the hot tub so it can't drain in the pool, the hot tub just builds up more and more water. And when you move, it's like, boom, all rushes out. I think that's the same thing that's going to happen, especially to like the travel industry. I think Maui's going to be hit with the biggest travel boom we've ever seen because of like everyone's pent up in their houses. Like I got to get out of here. And then they're all going to, it's like that pent up energy. I think if this goes away in the next month or two, I think we'll see strong growth this coming year. Did you see that picture in China? There was like a thing on. Oh yeah. 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 So were there a few days ago, they said like, Hey, you can go back outside. And it was just yeah. like, everybody went to all the big tourist destinations yeah. and it just showed, you know, a gazillion people like going on this hiking trail at the same time. Yep. 
the now yeah. the fear is does that does that just restart this whole virus thing among the population and then they have to go do it again that's what i've heard some people predict it's too bad that china's you know it's such a different country than ours that we can't follow their lead for what's going to happen next so i guess the human condition though tells us that as soon as people are allowed to go out i've wondered hey when we're allowed to go out are we going to be too scared to be around people are people ever going to shake hands again? Are we going to change these habits? But I think maybe one thing that we can learn from that picture is the human condition says as soon as people are allowed to get out of their house, I'm get out. They're going to go get out of their house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think that employers are going to be quick, you know, quick to hire people again? And and you know, I guess that's my only concern with the market is that you've got a lot of people that have been laid off. I'm, I'm sure employers are realizing that they can still function without having you know this big infrastructure, having all these workers at, you know at an office, and people are working from home now. Um, I guess that you know that's my only concern with the market rebounding, you know, quickly. So if this lasts two months, yeah, I think you're right. Um, but if, you know, if this is a long drawn out play, then who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. It's like yeah. commercial real estate news, right? So the, we closed our offices, we had everybody work from home. So we made sure that we didn't, we weren't going to have any, you know, office rent that was due during this time. And that was even when it was only going to last a month. And now we're going to be in a month two of not paying our office rent. And after, you know, another 30 days, we'll be like, hey, that's a savings that we can keep every month right now. There's when people are trained to work successfully, you know, so I wonder what uh, I think commercial real estate will likely take the biggest hit from habits that will change. I agree. But I think it's going to open up more opportunities. Like uh, somebody brought up the fact the other day to me, like, who's going to want to put their parents now, knowing that this is a thing into like big nursing homes? I sure wouldn't. Like when my parents get older, I wouldn't want them going to a nursing home because it's just like a this like festering of disease now so like are there opportunities for more real estate development in terms of like you know almost like a shelter in place or like age in place kind of thing but like you know individual private homes like maybe that's going to be like the next thing instead of cramming everyone in a little but i don't know i think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities i think uh jay scott who hosts uh, the bigger pockets business podcast he made an interesting point about like half the restaurants in the country will probably go out of business in the next few months which is sad but half them are gonna go out people still need to eat so what a massive opportunity for people who want to start a restaurant is going to be like in the next few months. So like, it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't think ener- like kind of like energy doesn't disappear or was it was matter is not created or not created just transfers. I kind of think no. the same thing. I think business doesn't disappear or appear. It just transfers is my theory. Yeah. People, people are still, yeah. People still want to eat. People still want to go out. There's going to be that big. I mean, I think that, that comment there too, of people, you know, wanting to not have their parents go into a home, that's going to maybe in real estate, it's going to increase a lot of added value in those in-law quarters, right? Mm-hmm. Like they've always had a value to people like having the house we just got has a, has a separate building that, that my office runs in right now, but the, maybe there'll be a separate value to that to be like, Hey, now somebody can, you know, shelter in place a lot closer to home. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that will be interesting news. The, you know, Curtis, have you, have you gone out and done any, so are businesses still operating in Dallas right now or are, are restaurants opening, delivering places like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, just the, the standard rules, like, you know, the, it seems like most, I mean, the car washes are open. I didn't realize that was a, an essential business, but um, so it's, it's a little bizarre to me what's open, what's not open, but you know, everything seems to be going normal. Except, you know, I was driving to one of my rental properties the other day, it was eight 30 in the morning in downtown Dallas and there was no traffic. So I was, I was driving and marveling about, you know, all the cars on the road and thinking to myself, all these people are essential workers. And then it was, then I realized, yeah, I'm in Dallas at eight 30 with no traffic at all. So, um, it didn't seem like it's that bad, but, um, people, I think people are definitely, you know, taking this seriously and sheltering in place and kind of trying to ride this out. Yeah. Are the surf shops in Maui essential, Brandon? Can you still, can you still <laughs> uh, go rent surf, a surfboard? The surf shops, I do not believe are essential. There's no tourists on the island right now anyway. Yeah. Everybody that lives there has a surfboard. We already have our boards. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> the, so there's uh, an opinion article that, you know, that, that hit on Inman today that I think is definitely worth some conversation for agents that are out there. Right. So we have so many of our, so many of our listeners are just real estate agents. And this headline says, Hey, six realities, your buyers and sellers should prepare for. Right. And as you look out there, there's a lot of things going on and I'm just going to read them off really quick and see what you guys think about it. So it says the buying and selling landscape has changed. And as a reminder, if you guys are listening right now on Facebook live on the real estate rock stars with Pat Hyben Facebook page, the, you can ask us questions. We're going to answer them live today. And the, and if you are not the, and you want it on the future state of the markets, go, go to that Facebook page, you know, add yourself to the group. We'll add you to the group. That way you can get in there. And then you can ask questions during these future state of the markets because we would love to start getting your guys' comments, opinions, and questions 
about the news that we might be missing as we're flying through here. So back to six realities your buyers and sellers should prepare for. Buying and selling landscape has changed. Seems pretty obvious right now. The transaction will likely be socially distanced. We're, we'll come back to that, but I think that's an interesting comment. The Now is the time to try to take advantage. This is buyers might be tempted to throw out multiple low bar offers at sellers to see what will stick. Um, delays will inevitably happen. Adjust your expectations and accept that you might not have all the answers. I'm going to start with that one for the big beginning thing. Like that's, that's like the big thing that everybody needs to remind themselves right now. Whatever was normal will never be again. We will come out of this in a different normal, right? Life will be forever changed. It, you know, the varying level of what I think will be changed, you know, that's going to, we're going to find that out. But business is going to be done different for quite a while. So that idea of just coming out of this going, hey, accepting that you might not have all the answers and being honest with your clients, you know, being honest with people and just go, hey, we don't quite know how this is going to impact yet. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it's all going to work. And so the, you know, accepting that you don't have, this one is tough. It can be easy to panic about the thought of the unknown. Will things get better after mid-April when the temporary closures are open with all our arbitrary dates and deadlines? You're going to have customers asking you like, hey, what should I do? Will it get better? Will it get worse? And I think it's okay just to say, I don't know, but I'm going to educate myself the best we can. Yeah, I mean, we're hearing that all the time. It's on a daily basis, customers asking what, you know, should I pull out of the market right now? Should I keep trying to buy properties? And I think we're, we're giving them that same answer. Like, here's an educated guess based off the data that we have and the articles that we've read. Um, but, you know, three months from now, this we're going to look like geniuses or, or it's going to be a totally different uh, landscape. Yeah. So Brandon, one of them says the transaction will likely be socially distanced. What do you, what do you think that means? What, do, what are they saying with that? Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. First, I closed on a property a couple of days ago. And, you know, this is pretty normal for me anyway. But like I had a mobile notary come to my house. Uh, we didn't shake hands. And I did all the, the transaction stuff right there. The seller did the same thing. Now, that's pretty normal. Now, in some states, I don't know what Texas is like, like where they actually make the buyer and seller still sit down at the table together. Like, is that Texas? We, we can do mobile notaries here. Yeah. Okay. But, but is it normal to like sit with a seller? Like some states it's like normal. You wouldn't it, buy or sell a house without being at a table. People still ask me, will I be there with the keys? Yeah. And I, I and I do tell them, no, I'm doing, I'm doing the most. So I think it is customary yeah. for a lot of the transactions to happen, you know, where people are shaking hands at the table together. Yeah. I think that's going to end with this whole thing. And I think that should end. I think this is, it's like the weirdest thing. Like, it's like you just had like this weird, awkward, like three months negotiation and you're buying their house and it's so emotional. And then they force you to sit in a room with somebody like, I don't know. They made me fly into Ohio. I bought a property in Ohio last year. They made me fly into Ohio to meet with the seller at the same time at the table. And it was like really in, in, uncomfortable. So, yeah. Uh, How anyways, big was that property? A, yeah. What? It was a 24 oh. unit apartment building. Okay. That's the, that's so, maybe that, that's probably worth the flight to Ohio. Yeah, it was, it was probably worth it. And I think it was more of a lender wanted me there. So he could like build a relationship with me thinking I was going to buy more, which I didn't really buy that much more. But, uh, Anyway, so the, 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 the yeah, signing, I think that's a big thing. I, I interviewed a guy on our podcast, comes out this coming week here, uh, that he, they, they do work in Dallas. They're like doing like 125 wholesales and flips every year in Dallas. And he said, what they're doing right now is like they're advertising, we will buy your house uh, or we will sell you a house, you know, 100% virtual, like social distancing. So they actually like go to, when they're buying a house, they'll go and bring an iPad and like, wipe it off wearing gloves, hand it through the door. That's like mostly closed. And so the person will go through and like take the tour of their own home or they'll do it on a zoom call. So like they have all these systems set up for actual closings of uh, social distancing. I thought that was kind of uh, interesting. Yeah. We had some sales over the last couple of weeks where agents called ahead of time and said, Hey, has anyone seen the house in the last day? Cause they only wanted to show it. If no one had been there in the last day, ask permission if they could go. So it used to be like, go and show like, Hey, is it okay? And is it safe to go? We've seen people doing a lot more of the the video call interviews. You know, the technology. I think there's a, you know one of the technologies out there that has started to get better and better over the last few years. The is kind of that walkthrough technology out there where people can do the three D virtual tours, where you can click through it and really. I mean, I can't imagine buying a property like that all the way, but I could imagine narrowing it from ten houses down to two based on the things because some of it's like oh, needing to count bedroom s- sizes or is there a bedroom near the master for my kid or, or something? And so I think a lot of that technology will, will, you know, we'll start to see that. What about notaries? The, you know, so Curtis, you're a notary. Do you think they're going to tr- change some of the notary laws to be able to have people do it remotely? And like, whereas not just a mobile notary, but like, Hey, where I could sign on a video and have somebody notarize it. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we closed on some properties last week where they they said, yeah, that's fine to have just a, a video notary. And um, I, you know, I don't know if state laws are going to adjust to that, but I know lenders are saying, hey, you can notarize this over video. Um, you know, you're attesting that you know who that person is, and typically, uh, you know, when you see a, a driver's license over Zoom, is going to be just as good verification as as if it's in person. So there's not, I don't see a lot of reason to have you know in person notaries. Right. The notary uh, themselves is the one taking the risk on it, right? Like they're the yeah. one. So I signed, I FedEx it to you. You stamp it at that point. You're the one saying, hey, I, you're, you're, you're taking the leap and the risk to say, I believe this is his signature that I watched him sign. And do that. I mean, it's, it's also easy enough just to go to like, the, you know, UPS where they always have notaries and spend $6. So you know, in, instead of trying to find a, a notary to come to me, you know, we had to close on three deals and I just drove to UPS real quick. Um, and so it, I don't think it's as big of a hassle yet. Um, now if they close, if they said like UPS and, you know, postal services are not essential, then I think we'll see some modification to those rules. Agreed. So far, the UPS is essential. The, uh, it, it, on, you know, the, like the CEO of FedEx and UPS, they're sitting at a table with, with Trump and, you know, they're talking about how are they going to, you know, keep going around. It's, you know, one of the things that Pat said six weeks ago when we were like, Hey, is, is coronavirus going to be a big deal? At that time, he said, you know, Donald Trump wouldn't have asked for two and a half billion dollars to fight this thing if he didn't think it was a big deal. And that was before any of this had broken out. And now it's a two trillion dollar, you know, yeah. thing. But at the time he was trying, you know, trying to get ahead of it and saying, hey, let's let's pull some money and be ready for some of this. That was before they knew the shutdown was going to be part of it. So transaction will be socially distanced. I think that is definitely changing. Buyer and seller landscape is changing. The you know, one thing on here says now is not the time to try to take advantage. So I kind of uh, read that wrong. It says buyers might be tempted to throw out multiple lowball offers at sellers to see what will stick. They might feel like they're entitled to a deal during these unusual circumstances. Stop. While you can certainly try to negotiate, trying to rub salt in the wound of what's already a trying time probably isn't going to go over very well. And so the that's a, I mean, that's, that's a moral such, piece of advice. So the that's written by such a. I was gonna say it's written by such a hippie real estate agent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we want everyone to feel good during this time and we want to give sellers hugs. And so we would actually like you to overpay for a property because that'll make everybody feel better and help the industry as a whole. So we'd actually prefer if everyone just doubled their offer. Let's just do that. that that's what yeah, I Yeah, pay everybody more. We pay everybody more because that would make everyone feel better. During, yeah, I think that's ridiculous. Perfect. Just on the houses I'm selling. Yeah, exactly. I, well, yeah. On my houses, you can pay double. Yeah. I'm going to still make low. I mean, I, I'm obviously like, I don't think sellers are going to adapt to this new market quite as quick as, as buyers will. So like I will throw out a low ball, low ball offer all day right now and, and hope to get something. I don't think sellers are going to take it, but there is zero downside to me doing so. Like zero downside to me breaking right. an offer. Right. There's never been a downside to that. But right now, and right now, some of those people might be like, hey, I know that if this was a normal market, I could get my full price for it. But I also don't want to wait 90 days till it's a normal market. So you never yeah. know. I think there's a, a problem with not doing that is if it's if it's only worth 80 cents on the dollar to me, I should be writing that offer because there's a chance they need that offer. There's yep. a chance they want that offer because they would rather sell it for 80 cents on the dollar today. So you just did a huge deal out in out in Maui. And when we were we were talking about it like a few weeks ago, it was right when this was starting to happen. Mm -hmm. And the and I was like, are you going to go through with that? So as a buyer, did you did you change any of the terms? Because in, in general, I think any house that was listed, I think any house is worth less today than it was three or four weeks ago. Did yeah. you take that into consideration when you bought that house? Yeah, we did. So a couple of thoughts we put into it. One, you know, when we put our offer, our, and this is just a lesson I learned, like the contract we used was a fairly like boilerplate purchase and sale agreement that didn't real, it didn't specify what would happen if we backed out. So this was a lesson. So like, it, 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 the fear I had was that they could sue me for non-performance and they were trying to 1031 and it would have screwed up their other deal. And it could have been a, a, a legal mess. So I didn't want to back out. Right. Uh, so lesson learned, I should get better, a better contract, which I'm working on. So that said, we still pushed because I mean, this whole thing collapsed around us. It sucks for the seller. It sucked for us. I'm afraid I was afraid of going through the deal a little bit nervous. Um, and so what we, we were in contact for 9.35. We ended up dropping it down to 8.99. Uh, we basically just said, look, the, the world's changed. So we needed more of a discount. Uh, I was hoping for more than that. But hey, you know, 35, 40 grand off was still a good. Uh, it gives a little bit of breathing room. Uh, and then a buddy of mine actually convinced me because we're going to flip this property. He actually mentioned to me, he's like, well, think about it this way. If you bought this property, tried to sell it, it didn't sell because the market's kind of crazy. You end up holding it for a year. 
Now you pay short-term capital gains instead of long-term. Uh, you can break even on the cash flow. So you'll just sell it a year from now or two years from now or three years from now and probably make more because of the taxes than you would have anyway. So I was like, oh yeah, that's true. So in other words, what I did is I, I made sure the reason I went through with it and the reason I'm still buying in today's market, we're still, I mean, we're, I think we put six offers in last week on mobile home parks. The reason we're still doing it is because we have the backup plan of we're going to rent these things out as long as it takes. Uh, we're living on cash flow still. I mean, we're still surviving. Like, like I believe cash flow is like a, a good defense against you know, losing your property. So as long as you can cash flow or break even, you can't lose. So that's, that's how I'm looking at it. Speaking of, of Brandon as mobile home park. So if you guys don't follow Brandon on Instagram, I don't know you got a hundred thousand followers on there, but the, but you have this big offer you have out there right now for if somebody finds you a mobile home park, is that still going right now? Do you think it more is. and more people are going to need me to come help you? Yeah, I think, I, I think what we're doing is we're basically just said, Hey, bring Brandon a deal.com. We made the website, bring Brandon a deal.com. It's like, Hey, 50 grand. If you find me a mobile home park an off market mobile home park, because, you know, like, why not get other people involved in the grand scheme of things? If it's a $20 million purchase or $10 million purchase, what's 50 grand for a referral fee? We can handle that. We'll just put into our numbers, make sure the deal still works. But um, yeah, there's a lot of people sitting at home right now, not making money or, or bored to death. So why not pick up the phone and start calling? So that's what we're doing is we're just trying to get other people involved with helping us find properties because we're still buying. Yeah. And I think, well, I think that the, we can agree that we don't necessarily think that is great advice on there for the, uh, I think stuff is going to have to transact right now. I think values have changed. I understand not adding insult to injury, but the, yep. but you send over an offer because maybe somebody wants to close it. You know, I sold one of mine for a lot less last week than I thought I was going to, cause I just want to sell it because I would yeah. rather not have an extra property right now. The, yeah, people, uh, people tend to like put their own bias into their seller's mind. And so they're like, well, you know, I don't want to offend them with a low price offer, but you might be offending them by not making an offer. Cause really they were in their head. They were okay with an 80% offer. They just needed to, to sell in the next three weeks, which now you just offended them. And now you just ruined their life because you didn't make an offer because you put your bias in their, in their head, you know? And yeah. So anybody can always say yes or no to a deal. Curtis, are you, are you, did you sell any houses this week? Yeah, we're, we're going back and forth trying to, uh, I mean, we're, we're getting the low ball offers. We, you know, but as a, you know, as an investor, you're always getting low ball offers anyway. Yeah. So, um, kind of like Brandon said, we, when we purchase properties, we're happy to flip them, but we also buy them, uh, knowing that we could have to rent them out. And so as long as we can cash flow on the, as a rental, then we're happy to buy it. And so, you know, we're going to keep our, the properties that we have listed, we'll keep them listed. Uh, if they don't sell, you know, with at an acceptable asking price and we'll just rent them out. And we, like Brandon said, two, you know, two or three years, we'll either uh, keep them in the portfolio or we'll sell them and um, realize those gains then. Yeah. So this, this next article, I think the, uh, I think the headline might be a little skewed and unfair. So this was Inman uh, it came out yesterday. It says Keller Williams franchises consider reducing agent profit sharing. So a franchise owner confirmed that they were suggested to roll out all expenses into the current April budget and able to hang on to more cash. And if they do that, then all their profit share agents are going to get less of a profit share. So I read it. And as I looked through that, I was thinking, you know, there's lot, cause there's lots of different agency news going on. There's agents, agents closing, um, you know, in the same, another article, same time says Redfin is furloughing 41% of its real estate agents. So the company announced it's also laying off 7% of its staff. So there is, so, so I think there's two strategies there. There's one that says, and in times of crisis, there's strategies. So there's one strategy that says you lay people off, you close offices, you close overhead, you close expenses. It's good. I agree with that. Another strategy that I remember seeing, this was back in like 2006 and 2007, when I worked for this home building company. Right. And the, and the, right when the market started to crash, they had some cash. So what they did is they paid for our office space for the next 12 months. They paid cars off for the next 12 months. They, they, they spent a, they, they, they purchased a bunch of things to know that no matter what we could survive for the next year, if we had to. Mm -hmm. So I think there's two interesting strategies on that in the, and it ends up looking like, well, there's less profit share. Yes. It's about survival. We had David Osborne on here a couple of weeks ago talking about, you got to put your oxygen mask on first. So if you're going to be a business owner, you put yours on first because when the economy comes back, you need to be able to hire people. So what do you guys think of those kind of two articles and in general, and we've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of agencies are doing the same thing. Have you guys heard it from agents where you're at? And do you think there's a philosophical reason why you want you to do one or the other? I mean, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a decrease in real estate activity. It's not, there's not, it's not as sexy to uh, list your house right now. And, um, you know, I don't know if, if laying off agents is necessarily the right answer, but, um, you know, 
I think we're, we're just trying to make a reaction and, um, you know, the people that, that keep going right now, like you said, are going to, uh, they're going to be able to keep going after, after this crisis is over. I think that not, what is it? What's the stat? I don't know. You guys don't know the stats more than I do, but like 90% of agents or 10% of agents make more than 90% of the other agents or whatever. It's like vast majority of agents don't make anything anyway. Those are the ones getting furloughed, laid off, not working and going to struggle. I mean, everyone's struggling a little bit, but I don't know. I think that, uh, this is going to call the herd of the 4 billion real estate agents that are in America today. And uh, yeah, the, the cream of the crop will rise and they'll be fine. And everyone else will go find another job. It's time to work hard. It's time to work. It's time to work hard and double down. You know, I, I I've said this several times over the last few weeks, I spent the first few days of realizing this was a big shift, like closing offices and looking at expenses and doing whatever I could to make sure I could survive for the next nine months you know, kind of following that strategy of pay off what you have, make sure you've got enough yeah. to pay all of your expenses in case you make no income over the next nine months. Yep. Right? So I did that. So for like three days, I was super sad. Then on day four, I woke up and said, all right, now we got to start doing, you know, some webinars today. Now we got to start creating new products. Now we got to start reaching out to our customers and see what they need during this time. Like it's the time to innovate. And I think there will be plenty of people that have kind of dabbled in real estate. I don't think there's gonna be very many people right now saying, I'm going to get my real estate license. Yeah. Right. Not very many people next month are going to say, you know what, I really want to go get in and start selling houses. I think it's going to be a little while. So there's an opportunity for for the the cream of the crop to rise. And when you're reading those headlines out there of this, this company's doing this, just read the article because the headline is very different than the description of of, and how you can take that. You know, it's the same as the news of coronavirus that's out there. Right. There's, you know, you could see each article as one way or the other. You know, down to just our last couple articles, the, uh, you know, we've talked about, we talked about the Dallas developer. So this is maybe the, the funniest one. And it says, as I pull up to the top of the article, 10 cities best prepared to weather a coronavirus fueled economic storm. So this is, it's Taylor, it's, it's titled analysis on Inman. And it goes through and it says, well, most Americans are anxious as the coronavirus pandemic widens and, it's, and veins its way through the center of the community. Some cities are better prepared than others. This was a new study that Redfin released. And so Redfin released it. And so their motivation, I don't know what their motivation is. And it says, Rochester, New York, the industrial upstate New York City has a relatively affordable home prices. Now, when I think New York right now, I do not think someone is going to weather the coronavirus storm very well. So the, maybe yeah. there's something I'm missing. Hartford, Connecticut says, you know, at one point, the capital of Connecticut's high vacancy rates, you know, led experts to believe it was poised for a future crash. But now it's doing good because of jobs. Raleigh, North Carolina, Buffalo, New York, Kansas City, Missouri has a 39% risk of falling into an economic recession. For the, the time being, at least, the number of coronavirus cases is low, though. So they're, so all of them have like a, a version of it. Columbus, Ohio, Richmond, Virginia, Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Indianapolis, Indiana. If you lived in one of those cities or invested in one of those cities, do you invest in any of those cities, Brandon or Curse? Uh, we don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, I'm right outside. Well, not quite outside, but I'm up in northern Ohio. Uh that's about the closest I got. Yeah. I, you know, I, we, what I think is funny about lists like this, I was telling you guys this earlier, is it's like, I feel like half the time they're just like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a marketer. Like I, I write blog posts and stuff like that. So I like, like you're just like grab 10 cities quick and tell me why they why they may matter. Like that's what I feel like with most people now. I'm sure there was some more logic put into this. Uh, like the fact that like they didn't put Maui on here because Maui's just getting decimated because it's all tourism, right? So obviously they had a little bit of thought into it. What I, what I thought was interesting though is that where they say like, uh, these are the 10 best and they all have like 39 to 45% chance of economic collapse. Yeah. 43.2% <laughs> like, chance yeah. of economic risk due to the virus. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that is like pulling stuff out of the air. Yeah. I'm like, what does that even mean? And then first of all, does that mean every other city in America, the other 50,000 cities are greater than 45% chance of economic collapse? Maybe, but where did everyone, where, where, like, where do we get these numbers from? Well, especially, so yes, yeah, some of them say risk of economic collapse. Some of yep. them say uh, economic risk due to the virus. So that's yep. two totally different different things too. Yes. I think that the uh, I think every city in America has an economic risk right now. The I think yeah. the I, I saw the jobs report this week that said you know all these jobs are down. Hospitality was obviously like the biggest um, you know you know down in March, and but the government gained ten thousand jobs, right? So I guess the only the only part where you're stable is going to be you know DC where where the government comes in. So if you were going to change that around, so the, 
you know, if people are going to look local, I would say don't take articles like this and bank on them, right? It's all like know your market, know local, look at the stats that are out there to try to prepare yourself. So if you guys are going to take the same question and say, is there a part of the real estate industry that you think is more at risk due to coronavirus and a part that's less at risk due to coronavirus, what would, what would, either, what would each of you say? Start with you, Curtis. Do you know, what, do you know which ones you think are going to be, do the best and the worst in this? I mean, I think just like during most other downturns, the more at risk are going to be the luxury, the luxury markets, the ones that are dependent on tourism. Um, I think the lower the properties or the the markets are going to be less at risk are going to be the uh, lower income. So, like in North Texas, it's going to be it's going to be you know, a one hundred fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollar house. There's always going to be a demand for that. We're always going to have blue collar workers um, in North Texas, that, and those jobs aren't going away. Um, and so, I think you know we, we'll see a good. Sp- spectrum of of uh, that across texas and i assume that all these other markets too i mean the, the funny thing is i think a year ago aaron you sent me an article that i live in mckinney texas and and uh you said hey like mckinney is the worst place to buy a house right now yeah that was and on then, msn money yeah that was, right? it was, it was just, like the worst it, place in the world was where you lived yeah it was like and i was like that's crazy and, and it, the article looked just like this by the way the same like i mean even the styling so uh, probably the same author or something, but <laughs> you said that to me. And then the next day I actually went and searched it and McKinney actually was ranked the number one place in America to live. And so I, I just, I don't know that you can give any weight to these. Um, like, like you said, Brandon, I just like, where do you choose Richmond, Virginia from? Um, yeah. Yeah. So what do you, what do you think, Brandon, if, it, if it's not a, if it's not a real estate market, is there a type of real estate you think will do better than others? I mean, I think commercial real estate is going to struggle a little bit, right? Cause all these companies I realize they can have their people work from home. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that severe because, I mean, even if you can work from home, most people don't like, I mean, most people in the world don't want their employees working from home, whether or not they can or not. I think there's still like a certain energy that people like in office. So I think it'll be okay. Vacation rentals, I think, are going to suffer for a little while, though I'm not saying it's a bad time to buy a vacation rental. In fact, I think now might be the best time in human history to buy a vacation rental, being that, let's say you bought something right now from a desperate seller because vacation owners right now are making nothing. So you buy something, get a great deal on it. When this thing goes away six months from now or a year from now, you've got a great rental property, uh, vacation rental. So I think it's going to suffer for a little while. Um, I, I would not invest in large nursing homes right now, <laughs> but uh, but in affordable housing, I think I think there's always going to be demand for that. Just like uh, you said, Curtis. So I think that's where I'd probably focus my efforts, and that's why we're buying mobile home parks because I think that there's always going to be the demand for like the lowest income housing you can get before homelessness. Yeah. You think in these like more vulnerable areas, like like let's just say you know senior housing, they're going to have like COVID certified or or some sort of like pandemic certified. Like, hey, we have the best air filters out here, um, or or you have your own unit, AC unit, or something like that, uh, where people are going to be able to take advantage of this. I could see that being a marketing thing going forward. We've like, started uh, to see that on Airbnb, right? People marketing is like, hey, we're we're a COVID friendly place. Like we you know we do we bleach everything between every guest. Like we have a certain you know, list of things that, that people will do. The I know I know my personal Airbnb investment in uh, California and Oregon are both hurting right now. Yeah. The you know we'll get to we'll get to see how long that lasts. You know, and maybe a, a a personal question to each of you guys. So the so concerts, right? So concerts, and you know we had we were going to be going to to New York for a Broadway show, and my wife was going to be going to Phoenix for some concerts. Do you think that once people are allowed to get back out? The or, or maybe even you personally that was something. Are you going to be like, hey, I'm ready to go to a, conf- uh, a concert right away? Are you going to be ready to go step? You know, do you think people are going to go to basketball games again, and you know, soccer games again, and concerts? Do you think it's going to take a while, or do you think industries like that will come back up quick? I mean, I, I personally think it's going to take a while. Um, I'm sure that the you know NFL stadiums are going to be full. I don't know how long that'll take, but you know, my wife and I were just talking about you know football season starts, are, are we going to get season tickets? Are we going to, and, and my answer was no, because, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't not, I'm not comfortable bringing my family out. Um, and I think, I, you know, I, I'd like to see kind of what, what else happens to the herd before, before we do. And I don't know if that's going to be the mentality that the average American family has, or is that just going to be kind of the people who are a little bit uh, you know, more uh, risk averse? Right. You've got young kids. Exactly. Yeah, Brandon, you have young kids too. You think you're going to be ready to go to concerts and yeah, stuff like would, that again? I would jump on a cruise ship next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That's like the one thing I wouldn't do as a cruise right now, even though I really love cruises and I would love to do it. Um, um, I think cruises are going to be decimated and I think they're going to be decimated for a long time. There were still uh, people getting on cruises like last week. Like I, I can't believe they haven't just shut them all down. Like I couldn't. That is crazy they haven't shut them down. 
But like, I mean, how many people out there? I mean, like, I, I d- don't believe anything that's going on right now. There's like, this is a government conspiracy to yeah, they're make us vaccinate. Yeah, they're those people are always going to be out there, so they'll still be going to stuff. I don't think. I think. I think within a couple of weeks of being freed up, everyone will, for, will collectively forget this period of life. I think you can go back to concerts and sporting events. I think I did, we have to just get past this entirely before that'll happen, though. Because yeah. until then, fear is going to drive people. But no one's afraid to get in a car. I mean, you know. For, you get in a car accident for a few weeks, maybe you're nervous about getting in a car and then you get back in the car again, you're fine. It's not a lifelong fear. Usually. Dude, that's a great point and, and such like a, and, a, and really a hopeful point to it. So yes, as humans, one of our survival techniques is we remember bad stuff that happens to us. And another one of our survival techniques is we forget a lot of the, the bad stuff that happens to us, yeah. right? So we can go on and be happy again. So we'll get to see, you know, stuff like that function again. But if you don't believe in any of it, you could probably get a great deal on a cruise ship right now. Flights like, yeah. you know, there's... Whereas like a flight and lay down seats from, you know, Dallas to Maui would have been, you know, eight grand round trip, you know, last month, they're a thousand bucks right now. And when you get there, you have to stay in your hotel for two weeks, but the, but still (laughs) there is a a way to try buying flights right now is a deal. And if it's time to buy season tickets for one of those football games, I bet they'll be less expensive right now than ever before. You know, the, the last article, as we look at some good and bad news, back to foreclosures really quick, it just says, this is where we'll likely see the first wave of coronavirus fueled foreclosures. So the, you know, I had been, you know, personally thinking, you know, Las Vegas, they were one of the first to shut down. So much of their income there is based on, you know, hotel workers and casino workers that make so much on tips. And that's not going to be covered through any of the stimulus. Um, but it said, these counties have the highest foreclosure risks, about 14 of New Jersey's 21 counties we're ranked in the top 50. So that makes sense to me. They've got a coronavirus outbreak right now, uh, followed by 10 in Florida, according to the report, four counties in New York, three in Connecticut also made the top 50. The only Western and Southwestern counties that were at risk was Shasta County in Northern California near the Oregon border and Arizona, Navajo County near Phoenix. And it said that so much of it were, you know, that homeowners bought there recently at like the peak of the market, they're going to face the biggest issue. And it increases the chance of what happened in the great recession back in you know 2000 through early 2010s. The Midwestern states are pretty much immune. On the other side of that, it says, though, here's the countries with the low, you know, the lowest risk. And this all came from Adam Data Solutions. And Adam, they provide a lot of great nationwide data. So the, if you're going to get uh, Texas foreclosure data, I'd be getting it from, from Curtis and us over at, at, uh, at Roddy's. But the, for nationwide foreclosure data, they're great. They said, These are the counties that have the lowest foreclosure risks. One that Curtis actually mentioned earlier. It said on the other, you know, Texas led the nation with 10 of the 50 least at risk counties on the list. So the, and I think that's because prices are so much lower and so many properties out there have equity right now. It says three of these counties were in the Dallas metro area. Two were in the Midland area. The Lone Star State was followed by Wisconsin, seven of the least risky counties, Colorado with five. So you know, that's looking at, at statistics out there for where the coronavirus is, where jobs are and where pricing is. So they you know, went into a lot of you know, different details beyond that. So the, you know, so we've talked about, there's going to be a whole lot of extra factors that come in, but can you, can you guys either of you think of something that, that agents or investors should be thinking about out there as they start to look at that news? So foreclosures is one of the news, right? It's also a, a, a news piece. And one of the reasons we got Curtis on here today is because we, we knew that so foreclosures were so much in the news, but that's a, a, that's a word that the news agencies like to say. So is there anything else that we should be paying attention to out there? Um, you know, when you're thinking about the market? I mean, my, my thought is kind of the same advice I've given, whether it's a real estate agent, whether it's an investor, whatever is like, uh, we don't know, like you know, you play a game of like Texas Hold'em, which, you know, for those that don't know, Aaron is a very good Texas Hold'em player. <laughs> I played a, in a tournament one time and he just cleaned up and just took uh, it. So that's just one time, one time. Yeah, it was, you were, you were a rock star. So, uh, we like a couple of cards are on the table right now. Like there's like, you know, three cards on the table. We don't know. I don't even know the terminology. The run, is that what it's called? The, yeah, the run and the river. river. The, okay. We don't know what those cards are going to be yet. Right. But you've got a couple of cards in your hand. So all we can do is play the cards like the best of our ability right now with the three that are on the table. And we can make decisions to bet or not bet based on that. When a new car gets flipped over, we got to change our entire strategy because that'll make us fold or bet. And so we don't really know. So it, to use it like a poker analogy, I guess, like if you're a real estate agent right now, like what's the best, best bet? If I was doing it, I'd be focused on things like you know, if, if foreclosures are coming, how do I become the guy who's listing all the foreclosures around here? How do I become an expert at that? What books am I reading on foreclosures right now in the process? And who am I building relationships right now with that will help me 
level up for that. And if it doesn't happen, if a new car gets dealt and everything goes away and no foreclosures happen, okay, well, how do I, now do I shift? What am I going to do now? So it's not really a specific advice as much as it is just pay attention to what's going on and adapt your situation quickly to whatever cards are being dealt. Yeah. yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, Aaron, when you talked about, you know, all the people that are buying properties you know, that have been buying properties are trying or probably have equity um, and built into them. And so um, I think in areas that you would have been more likely to see foreclosures before this, you know, you're still going to see it. Um, you're, you're probably going to see more for, or a foreclosure increase there. Um, I mean, to you know, use Brandon's analogy, if you had th- if you had three aces in your hand, and you had a great it's not like it's going to, you're, you're going to have a high card ace or something like that. You're likely to still be okay at the other end of this. Yeah. I think the, I think it, what's one thing that I would be telling people to look at right now is because there's, there's a lot of you know, real estate related stuff to see, you know, what's happening with the market. Look at how many new listings are coming on every week. Look at how many are going pending kind of that traditional stuff. What I'm focusing a lot on right now is actually the medical news, right? The, when do people think, we're going to get shelter in place lifted. When do we, cause the, I think that is going to have the significant biggest impact right now. And so I think they said, you know, now we're down to 30 days from now, New York is supposed to hit its peak, right? And to me, that means that 60 days from now, New York gets let off of uh, shelter in place. Cause they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna let you out during the peak, right? They aren't gonna release shelter in, in, in place at the peak of it. And if they're 30 days away. So I would be looking at your local markets for where that peak is. I would be looking into ways to, you know, get yourself different when it talks to like, you know, looking at the, you know, are you ready to social distance? Are you ready to look for the listings out there that have the 3D tours, things like that, you know, have those conversations with agents now to see what's the way to, to communicate and the same ones with those buyers, you know, they got to be looking at, so look at what's, what's happening in the health news out there and then what technology out there is going to help you. The... You know, so Curtis and Brandon, you guys were great today to come on to Real Estate Rockstars to talk about the market. The, you know, Brandon talked about the, you, you know, if, if you guys know of a mobile home park out there, go bring Brandon at deal.com. But you can also hear Brandon every week at the Bigger Pockets podcast. The, he is rocking it over there with our good friend, David Green. They talk everything investing. And you guys have been talking about a lot of the same stuff. I mean, you've still been interviewing people out there, but so much of it is, is hey, what's happening over here? You know, Curtis is on, you know, you, you can find Curtis over at flsonline.com. The, uh, any other, any other ways people should be reaching out to you guys, if they've got questions, and they want to ask you about, you know, foreclosures or mobile home parks or any of that, what's, what's your preference for how they come find you? Yeah, for us, it's always, you know, go into our website. We've got lots of resources. Uh, we've got a chat. So it's, uh, we're actually always monitoring that chat. So go in there and, and monitor that. We've also got a, a Facebook page, uh, Roddy's foreclosure listing service. Um, you can post questions there or see, we've got a lot of other uh, useful content for both investors and uh, real estate agents. I'm like a 13 year old girl when it comes to Instagram. So you can find me there. Beardy Brandon. <laughs> Beardy <laughs> Brandon and his beard Beardy is Brandon. getting bigger every, yep. every week, every month. And the listeners out there that are on the podcast right now, the, we are definitely encouraging you to go to our Facebook page, real estate rock stars with Pat Hyben ask to join the group. We want to get you on there because next week, when we do another state of the market, we want you to be able to ask questions about what's happening in the news. Send us some articles too. You know, get on there, send us articles earlier in the week. Let us know what you want us to talk about. We want to talk about the news and the news is so much Corona right now, but hey, it wasn't all bad news today. There was some hopeful stuff and some actionable stuff. So thanks for joining us on State of the Market. Rockstar Nation, thank you for listening to Real Estate Rockstars. Listen, I need a favor. If you find this free content helpful, if you find our downloadable items from each guest helpful, please, I need you to pull out your pointing finger. Yes, the one finger that points at people and hit subscribe. Yes, subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the better we look in the ratings and the easier it is to get guests like Robert Kiyosaki, Barbara Corcoran, all the players that are on million dollar listing in the different cities. All that stuff makes it easier the more subscribers we get. So please subscribe. And listen, there's a lot of places you can leave comments. There's a lot of places you can like. We're on Facebook. We have an Instagram page. Instagram pages, I am Pat Hyben. The Facebook is Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Feel free to leave us comments there. The most popular form of commenting seems to happen on YouTube. Yes, for whatever reason, it's a, a very open environment. So just go to YouTube and go to Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Leave us comments there. Some of them we will read on the show. 
we love your feedback so thanks guys and i hope you are having a great day oh and also listen if you're going to subscribe and you haven't already left a review on itunes please do that too have a great day and thanks so much rockstar nation i really appreciate you